What's going on there, Duelist? I'm back with another Yu-Gi-Oh! Retro Deck Profile, the series where I profile a deck of the past. Today, we're actually going to be profiling the first place North American World Championship Qualifier uh, Deck Profile from Corey McDuffie. Rest in peace. He was a really cool guy. I, I had the pleasure of knowing him, talking with him on many, many occasions. And, uh, you know, this was the deck that he actually piloted to a victory in 2014 Nats. I was there and... Um, Man, this was a really insane Nationals format, probably one of the most diverse Nationals formats I've ever seen. Everything from Sylvans to Light Sworn to uh, Dragon Variants to Hand artifact, artifact Trap Tricks, which is the deck today, Hat. Um, you know, Gear Gia to Infernities to just Count Bujins. So many, so many decks. Probably the most diverse Nationals format I've seen that, like in a long, long time. And uh, really, really wild. I, I mean, this was the deck that took first and second place. Uh, Corey and Dion both took first and second, which was really crazy with the same deck. And uh, this is a, the, the, basically one of the first times that this deck really took off. It was kind of low-key up until that event. And um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and show it off. This is Hand Artifact Trap Tricks, a.k.a. Hat, from 2014. If you guys haven't enjoyed the video, of course, like, comment, and subscribe to help me reach 50,000 subscribers. Starting off, we begin with the hand part, three fire hand and three ice hand. This was one of my favorite engines and still is to this day in Yu-Gi-Oh! It is such a diverse engine at the time and even till this day, it still allows you to break so many different boards. Fire hand allows you to pop a monster and ice hand allows you to pop a back row. And what's really cool is just between the two of them, uh, you just have so many different ways to break all the different boards at the time. And I think this is such a unique engine. Now, of course, the downside when a, with, with a card like this is it's a when uh, and can effect. So uh, keep that in mind. And then for the special summon part, there are some uh, nifty ways that you can you know avoid uh, getting destroyed by these cards. But um, they do have to actually destroy something. So keep that in mind to do the second part. Um, definitely an important part. It was fantastic in the mirror, fantastic against gear gear. Uh, helped you break board against boards against Bujins, like just so many different decks. Uh, almost every single deck at the time uh, would try and find a way to utilize these to some capacity. The hand part was probably my favorite part of uh, this particular deck, just because the uh, main decking then gave you such a such a diverse pool of options. Next is the artifact part, and really it's just three artifacts in the main deck. Um, this was a little bit unconventional at the time because a lot of people, when artifacts came out, tried to run stuff like Beagle Tack and mix with Moral Tack and some of the other artifacts, and it, just, it wasn't very good. Moral Tack was by far the best one at the time. Uh, of course, now in Yu Gi Oh! Scythe is probably praised as the best one because it shuts down an entire mechanic, but Moral Tack was fantastic. It allowed you to control the board so seamlessly, allowing you to pop a free card. And if your opponent ever popped a Sanctum, you could chain the Sanctum, get the Moral Tack, get two pops out of it, and uh, it was just very devastating. You know, Moral Tack is. Um, definitely the poster child of this deck. It was definitely what made uh, artifacts at the time. So really great. And having such a big body at 2100 attack was great. And then also being a five star, allowing you to uh, make some of those powerful uh, rank five XYZs was also fantastic. Now, the consistency aspect of this deck was through the roof. It was just a very grindy, versatile deck. And um, the monsters that were Trap Tricks, which was the triple Trap Tricks Myrmelio and double Trap Tricks Dinea, these allowed you to just constantly have board pressure whenever you, you weren't using your artifacts or your hands. That allowed you to get that degree of back row control that you otherwise needed. Uh, Myrmelio on its summon allows you not only to uh, fetch out any of the Trap Hole cards you need, so typically you would get out your uh, Trap Tricks Trap Hole Nightmare, and then once you would do that, anytime this was in the grave, you would have Dianea as a follow-up. She would allow you on summon to bring back your Myrmelio. And then on top of that, uh, you know, it just it just gave you such a cool, unique option to also have a, a trap pull card in your graveyard and you could set it afterwards. So really cool. And they had a, a fair amount of attack. Of course, they struggled to get over uh, some of the Gear Gear monsters. I would argue that that was probably the best, the, the worst matchup for this deck. Um, I at the time was playing Gear Gear and it was, this was probably one of my easiest matchups in terms of uh, what you would do. But most of the other decks would struggle against everything you would uh, you would put up because you could just e easily lock down their boards and literally just having a Meyer Melio on the field, getting a trap hole, and then just setting a bunch of back rows, backing it up with uh, the artifact engine was uh, very easy to uh, disrupt all your opponent's plays. So the Trap Tricks engine, maybe in the future, I'll, I'll do like a modernized Trap Tricks deck. Uh, utilizing some of the newer options that this deck has, but uh, really important. And then the final monster in the main deck was Double Max C. This was at three at the time. Um, the downside, uh, most people, you know, either mained or sided this to some capacity as a three of. Um, the re he actually in his side deck. I'm not going to show off the side deck. But you guys can look it up online. Uh, he sided the third one. Um, a lot of players didn't necessarily need to main deck three because Maxi wasn't particularly good against the mirror match for this deck. It's not really that great against Gear Gear. 
Um, most of the time, at the, you know, just in general, a lot of the decks at the time could just stop. Any of the ruler decks, any of the, any deck that would really special summon outside of like Sylvans and Infernities um, could stop whenever you were using Max C. So um, as good as this was and still, you know, would be today, um, a lot of the decks at the time uh, wouldn't necessarily just get blown out by you having Max C. Like there was a fair trade of like back and forth Max C's. Um, and, and really it was just it, a lot of times you would find yourself just one for winning max C and just having your opponent stop and you just get a free upstart out of it so um, that's kind of important to recognize for the spells uh, 3 MST particularly important because this was definitely a very you know a, as diverse of a format as it was there was a lot of different background decks like this answered Bujins, this answered the mirror match this answered uh, Girgias, this answered just so many different things you could use it against uh, infernities during certain situations um, you could use this against uh, the Sylvan matchup game one game two and three it wasn't as good uh, But game one you could use this against their fertilizer against their Sylvania when they were using it Just so many different versatile options for Maxi and you were also able to pop your own stuff if you ever needed to uh, Maxi or excuse me MST was just such a useful uh, utility card at the time obviously we didn't have twin twister but uh, Maxi or MST was just uh, very very important Three upstart goblin this was at three at the time 37 card logic um, allowed you to just maximize consistency same thing with three pot of duality. You weren't necessarily special summoning every turn. Um, you could hold off on, you know, crashing your hands. You could usually just play passively with them. And then with the artifacts, you were usually trying to summon them on your opponent's turn. So you didn't really special summon that often on your turn. So having three duality was just fantastic. No real issue there. Uh, one pot of dichotomy. This was an interesting pick uh, because this deck was such a. Um, it was kind of like a, uh, what's the best way to, it was a very generic deck in the sense that it was very toolboxy, had a lot of different types of monsters. Uh, Pot of Dichotomy allowing you at the start of your main phase to pick three monsters of different types in your grave, which most of the monsters, you have everything from insect to plant to, um, what else, to, you have fairies, you have pyro, you have, you know, aqua, you have so many different types of monsters that, you um, know, it's very easy to get diff all those different types. And you would shuffle those three in the deck and draw two cards, but you wouldn't be able to get a battle phase. So it's kind of like a Degusta Emerald roll a little bit in the deck. Um, very great card, just mid to light game whenever you're just trying to recuperate resources. And then the last two spell cards were one Dark Hole, um, just generic removal, and the one Soul Charge. Uh, at the time, Soul Charge was at three, but this deck was one of the few decks that didn't really need to play this at all. Honestly, you didn't really, even really need one, but it was just a very powerful card nonetheless. And you can use this to make some boards with Meyer Melio and Dine in the hands. Um, Really, this was just like a mid to late game card. You don't really want to see this early on. But these were just great across lots of different matchups, especially the Dark Hole. And then for the traps, uh, the in most important trap, I would argue, is the Three Sanctum in the sense that it uh, it just does everything you want. Like, it was very difficult to play against this deck because back removal tends to be good against control decks, but against a deck like this, uh, you you risk you run the risk of hitting a Sanctum, which means you're, you're not only going to be getting, you know, one card pop for the Sanctum, but you're also going to be getting another card of yours popped due to the moral attack and a body coming out. So you're usually going to be minusing. So you got to be very, very careful. Um, there were times where, of course, if your opponent drew the moral attacks, they could set them. You could also hit moral attacks that they bluffed. So there was a lot of different things to take into consideration when trying to deal with back rows. This is a very unique, um, you know, a very, a very unique prospect of this deck that a lot of other back row related decks don't really uh, uh, have the luxury of enjoying. Uh, this was definitely a highlight format for Trap Trick Trap Hole Nightmare. This was one of the few cards that was a breakout card at this time. Very unique. It was a Judgment of the Light card, so it was kind of under the radar, but it allowed you more or less uh, to have a you know a Divine Wrath-esque effect where when your opponent uh, has a monster that they special summon that turn and use its effect, you would not only negate that effect, but you also destroy it. So this was really good. Um, good players, of course, would just go like summon a monster like a Gear Guy again or whatever else, and then they would just like beat you down with it, and then they would just pass, and the next turn they would use those effects. So playing around this card was um, wasn't the most difficult thing. I think this was better um, to catch like worse players off guard. Um, I know I ran this in my Gear Gear deck, and I just I won so many games due to this, and uh, it was a very cool card for the format, for it, for sure. And of course, it was searchable, just like uh, Bottomless Chapel, which is also at one. Uh, just pretty much staple removal, Bottomless, Sunshine Tribute, uh, Compulsory Evacuation, these were all at one at the time. Uh, Call the Haunted, again, same thing, just some cool recursion there, some cool capabilities are being able to bring back Moral Attack, being able to bring back some of your side deck options. Um, you know, just in general, your, your Trap Tricks monsters overall. And then some final removal is Solemn Warning and Black Horn of Heaven, which uh, a lot of decks, you'd be surprised, like a lot of like, control decks at the time would run anywhere from like two to three of this. Um, Corey only ran one, obviously, but this was really good uh, because there was a lot of Inherent Summoning at the time, a lot of uh, XYZing. This was a very peak moment for XYZs. 
Uh, of course, this allows you just as soon as your opponent drops, especially a monster inherently, you just back back one ahead in it, and you just you don't have to deal with it anymore. It was really really powerful, and um, you know the fact that the monster would never hit the field was great against like Gear Gigan and such. So really important to keep that in mind. And then the final card, which was also a breakout card for the format, was Wiretap. This came out in Dragons of Legends early on, so cards like Curry Bandit and Soul Charge were all, you know all in there. This was really good against all the control decks. Uh, pretty much there would be so many different wiretap wars back and forth between players uh, trying to negate stuff like a basic trap tricks or a sanctum or you know a solemn warning or really just anything. Uh, the, the, the downside was, you know, having multiples of this was like early on. Of course, it, there was that that issue. Like, if you play against any of the combo decks, any of the dragon decks, any of the uh, the Sylvan decks or the Infernity decks, you would just have this card be dead. So you just needed other options. So um, it really just depends on what you played against. But um, he found one in the main deck to be more than sufficient. Uh, it's 40 cards main. Uh, the extra deck was absolutely wild. Um, very just all utility options. Like, there's not much else to say. The extra deck is just all utility. So. Uh, we have a Abyss Dweller, a Black Ship of Corn, and a Gaga Ga Cowboy for time. Of course, we didn't have the current time rules, but these are really important nonetheless for time. Rhapsody and Berserk to deal with the all the back or excuse me all the graveyard related resources that players would have. Banishing Girgias, uh, Girgianos was useful, you know, to prevent MK3 loops and accelerators and such. Uh, against Sylvans, you could use this to banish certain monsters that they would have in the grave, like if they had additional uh, lone fires, if, they, if you were able to stun them for a turn, or any other big trees. Against Lightshorns, of course, hitting all their stuff. Dragon Rulers hitting, uh, you know, any other things that they had in the grave for dragons or their resources. Just a very, very underrated card, and probably one of my all-time favorite uh, XYZ monsters in, in the game. And the fact you could equip and run over stuff, and it just had multiple utilities, was just fantastic. Karngorgon was certainly one of the, I would probably say, the highlight of this Nationals. It won me so many games when I played it, and I heard nothing but good things about it from everyone that topped and performed well at this event. And really just after that, the, the several events after that, like the ARG, the, 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 the first 20k that they had, and uh, so many other events. Like, Karngorgon was great because there's so much targeting, and a lot of people just slept on this card. And um, I, even, I think even in Corey's deck profile and so many other people's profiles, they, they probably just highlighted how useful this card was because all the targeting in the in the format, Carnegie just answers it so seamlessly, and very very important to have uh, a card that synergizes as a beat stick, but also has those unique capabilities in and of its own. Uh, Steel Storm Roach. This was just for any of the uh, the big decks that would just summon any other big monsters. Um, the other Roach, which was Evil Storm Exiton Knight, super powerful, really important to to play around this card actively um, and not put yourself in a position where you would just lose because of it. A lot of bad players would. Um, we just commit to the board and then just get Exiton and just auto lose. So it's pretty insane. And then Silent Honor Arc, again, very powerful at the time uh, from El Val. And then Lavavo Chain as the second to last uh, level four. This was just utility to put whatever you needed on top, like a Dianea, or you could put a Mermelia to the graveyard and then summon your Dianea. Um, a lot of cool, useful things up there. You could all you, you could put like Maxi to the top of your deck, or you could put some, you know, like Maxi or whatever else, and you could like pot, you know, upstart Goblin to it. Or you could uh, pot of duality into it. Just a lot of cool, unique options that the deck offered uh, with Lavalva Change. Very, very powerful card. And then the final uh, rank four for the for the XYZs was actually number one hundred six Giant Hand. Uh, for, I was fortunate enough to also have one. It seems Corey and a couple of the other top contestants were. This was uh, also given out at the event to the top 32 contestants. Uh, Giant Hand's one of my all-time favorite XYZ monsters. It was a super and ultra at the time. We did not have a reprint, so uh, this was a very pricey card. It was, I want to say, around like $800, $900, uh, give or take. And it was just, I, I, everyone that had this card, including myself at the time, just won so many games due to it. And... Um, yeah, it was it was it was in Corey's extra deck, and uh, I'm sure I'm sure it did him tons of uh, tons of uh, cool shenanigans. It was basically like an effect failure that was beefed up, and uh, you could use this against so many different decks. Everything from Bujins to Mir to uh, Girgias to Infernities, like literally just so many decks would just get you know demolished uh, if you giant hand them at the right time. Uh, for the fives, there was a Tyrus and a Constellar Pleiades, just use useful versatile options. Uh, the Volcasaurus to burn in time. And then finally to round off the, the fives, it would be a artifact Durandal, which was very cool. Um, you could, you know, get that free negation out of this a lot of the times. You know, people at this point hadn't realized that, um, you know, since nobody was really playing Droll Knockbird, there wasn't really like the Droll Knock Durandal uh, stuff that you could do kind of like reincarnation. But this is still really good, just a free negation whenever you'd get multiple moral attacks on the board. You know, you get use out of their effects, have them beat sticks, and then just put them together for a... Uh, 
for Durand also really useful. And then finally, for all your fives, you just have the single copy of Gaia Dragon, the Gaia Charger to pierce through stuff and uh, you know just mid to late game options. So that's it for uh, for the deck, the extra deck, uh, and the main deck. I will not be showing off the side deck. You guys can look that up as you guys see fit online. Um, if you guys happen to enjoy this video, please, 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 please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, check out the other videos on the channel. Make sure you guys let me know what other stuff you guys like to see. I love doing Yu-Gi-Oh! history and talking about this kind of stuff. It helps me take a trip down memory lane, but also gives you guys a little bit of insight into the format. And, uh, you know, it's just, you know, it's, this was this was a really crazy format. This is one of my favorite nationals, but also one of my most devastating nationals at the time. I'm sure some of you longtime fans know why. Uh, for those of you guys that don't, you'll know that, uh, yeah, unfortunately, I was one of the, the last match in time, last game, uh, at this Nationals, literally after a mid-round deck check and being up a game against this deck with my Gear Gear deck. I had to scoop game two because it was just like a stalemate, and, you know, if, if me and my opponent both uh, draw, then neither of us tops. And in game three, I just drew absolutely horrible, and my opponent didn't even deal me any damage. I had to, like, soul charge myself for a thousand to bring out an accelerator in defense and, like, pass, and um, I just couldn't do much in time, and... Um, yeah, I ended up losing in time in uh, the last round of the entire tournament in Swiss, and I ended up missing top cut, so that was mighty unfortunate. It is what it is, though. It was a great learning experience, and um, yeah, I still had a great time at that Nationals and during this format, one of my all-time favorite formats, surprisingly to probably many people out there. This is Hat. If you guys enjoyed this video, like, comment, subscribe, Patreon down below, my merch down below from the channel, as well as uh, just any other links you guys can get. Imperium Duel Sleeves and Mats using my 10% off promo code TWIZPRICE2018. Link down below. See you guys next time. Thank you so much for watching this brief moment of Yu-Gi-Oh! history and checking out this Hand Artifact Trap Tricks, aka Hat Deck, featuring the first place deck profile from Yu-Gi-Oh! Nationals, aka the World Championship Qualifier in 2014. Rest in peace to Corey McDuffie, a phenomenal, you know, just Yu-Gi-Oh! and Magic the Gathering talent, just transcended card games, just an amazing, amazing guy, and, um, you know, it's unfortunate that uh, he's no longer here with us, but nonetheless, uh, you know, his, his memory lives on through not only his, uh, his, his friends and family and, you know, his loved ones, but also just through all the things that he's done for the game, and this is one of those uh, pinnacle moments of the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game, so, uh, mad props and love to uh, go out to him, and, uh, yeah, that's it. I'll see you guys next time. Check it out and uh, yeah, subscribe if you guys already aren't already subbed. See you guys next time.